In today's episode, I am speaking with Alex Mufferson, Deputy Director from LGBT Foundation. I met Alex over six months ago and I was so keen for her to come on and be a guest for two reasons. One is Alex's story is so compelling about how she pursued working for the foundation. And I'm not going to say too much. I want you to listen to the episode and hear how she did that. But really how Alex has taken her lived experience to drive her passion and career forward and now being a leading voice for the LGBT community, very much in the space of providing education and support um, for healthcare organisations and other corporate bodies. It's just such an insightful discussion, but also, I hope, unpacks what is it you can do to understand how you can lead more inclusively. As decision makers and boards, what should you be thinking about and understanding those in the majority, those in the decision making roles? What should you be thinking about? What more can you be doing around education, awareness, understanding to increase representation um, and also increase inclusion in access to the health care and support or service that your organisation provides to colleagues and people from the LGBT community? And for me, I came away feeling, I say it a lot when we, um, when I have, when we record a podcast episode, but I came away feeling energized. I came away feeling inspired and I came away feeling a real sense of warmth from what Alex shares and how she operates and navigates and also giving a voice, such a powerful voice to others. You'll hear how she describes herself, um, but really giving voice to those who feel that they aren't heard, who may not feel that it's safe enough to speak up and really driving change. And as you know, one of the things that I am determined to see is that we empower and we encourage and we develop more change agents at all levels across um, the world. If I say in that way, not just healthcare, but across the world and across all industries. And Alex really explains to us how you can do that and how you can use your passion and your experience to drive change for good and to drive change on a big scale. I hope you enjoy listening. Hi, Alex, how are you doing? Like, you know, it seems, gosh, it was over six months ago, I think it was, that we first met. And I knew I wanted to invite you to join us on the podcast, so it's great to have you here. I'm good, thank you. Good. So I know lots about you and your journey and the role that you're doing now, and I want to unpack all of that in today's episode. But before we start, it would be great for the audience to know a a little bit about you and your role and what you do. Yeah, I am. So, um, Alex Matheson, my pronouns are she, her, and that's um, really important for me to to get across. Uh, I like it when people use those in their introductions. It makes it really clear for people. I'm the uh, Deputy Director of Education at LGBT Foundation. Um, So we're a charity that works to improve health and wellbeing for LGBTQ plus people. We have um, quite a large service provision arm. Um, So we do um, all sorts of different um, services such as talking therapy. We have a gender healthcare service, um, the first one based in primary care. And we also have um, uh, like rehab services, recovery services for drugs and alcohol, sexual health services. And then my area, um, which is education, um, and that covers um, provision of uh, inclusion support and um, quality assurance schemes. Tell us, so be, I know when you said that to me, I was like, tell me more. <laughs> so I feel like, oh, no, now we're here on camera. Tell me more. It'd be great for us to understand a bit more about what is included in that. Yeah. So in my area, we have um, a couple of our flagship programs that work predominantly in healthcare. So we have um, the NHS Rainbow Badge Scheme, which a lot of people have uh, heard of um, and seen. Uh, It started as a visible inclusion uh, symbol. So wearing a little rainbow badge, um, people could show that they're a safe person to talk to um, about matters surrounding um, LGBT plus communities Mm -hmm. and identities. And more recently, we took it from that into... Um, an assessment and accreditation scheme. Mm. So instead of it being like an individual person's responsibility to wear that badge and to show um, that they're safe person, um, actually making it a trust responsibility to um, put policies in place, to train their staff, to 
think about the uh, provision that they have for patients and uh, their workforce and really expanding on that first step of you know visibly being inclusive. We also have um, our Pride in Practice scheme that's um, been running for over a decade now and it's a similar kind of scheme but it's based within um, primary healthcare. Mm -hmm. So we support GP practices, dentists, pharmacists, ophthalmologists. Um, we provide training so that their staff can be more aware, they understand the barriers um, and inequalities that are experienced by LGBTQ plus people, mm -hmm. um, but we also um, assess them and grade them based on our findings. And the idea behind that is not just to say this is where you're at, yeah. but actually to provide an action plan of how to get to that next step yes. and how to make that meaningful change. So we have a bronze, silver and gold award, um, and then we support them to, you know, hopefully to, to pull all the practices up to that gold level. Mm -hmm. um, I also have our training academy, um, which as well as supporting healthcare, it, it works across multiple sectors and, mm -hmm. and a lot with um, corporate businesses as well. And that again is around understanding the needs of our communities, um, the barriers that are experienced when accessing services, be they healthcare or otherwise, yeah. um, and knowing how to support their own workforce and, and um, service users or customers. Yes. Um, and then I have policy as well. I've got quite a wide remit. <laughs> it's, it's quite a fun uh, role to have because I cover so many different areas. Yeah. Um, and our policy team looks internally, but also externally. Yes. So we do a lot of um, consultation work. Um, we do um, patient participation work as well. So like recently we've done um, consultations that have been put out by the government supporting uh, community members to, to know how to respond to them and to have um, guidance around being able to produce their own uh, unique responses and yes. and how to engage in that process mm -hmm. as well as I am um, actually as an organization engaging with it as well I uh, do you know I think it's so in, you see what you were explaining there the the different facets to your role mm. I really hear from you about like you said I mean starting from where you just finished the ability to influence policy but to help others to understand yeah. how to influence and respond to policy right down to like, coming right to front line isn't it and supporting mm. organizations with number one how to support your own workforce but also how you provide care and support and understanding that is more inclusive to the lgbtq plus community and understanding where i just really heard that spectrum yeah of all what you do or all what your role covers and um, so it, as an everyday person or as someone working in an organization if we if we wanted to under, know more about what you do and more about what lgbt foundation does where's the best place to find that out let's get that right up there yeah, right. yeah definitely our website actually just before christmas we um updated our website and launched the new one i am i'm loving it because we've had a load of um community photo shoots done <laughs> and i just think it looks brilliant um but there's so much information on there i um, so that's lgbt.foundation um, and you can see all the services that we offer direct yeah. to the community members, but then also the work that we do with healthcare professionals and yes. other organisations. Yeah. And that's why I was really, thank you. And we'll make sure we link that in the show notes. And it was when we did meet, it was one of the reasons I was fascinated. Number one, by, like I said, the breadth mm -hmm. of what you and your organisation does. Two, about your journey and story, which I'm coming on to. But three, I was like, it's, I really want to help share and let people know that this is out there because all too often I do hear organizations saying and people saying you know I, we don't know what to do or where can we get specialist support there's lots of generalist support out there but where can we get specialist support that we can really understand this better and have some support for how we maintain momentum yeah. how we hold ourselves accountable so I think that gold silver and bronze element of accreditation is also important it's not just the education yeah i think for us in both the nhs rainbow badge and the pride in practice work mm. that we do um the most important part is what happens after mm -hmm. the assessment mm -hmm. it's that action plan it's that expert advice yes. the guidance having someone actually you know tell you the stuff that you don't know mm. you know we say it all the time you don't know what you don't know yes. do you yeah. Um, and often it's really easy for people to get things wrong or to miss opportunities because there's a fear, mm -hmm. there's there's mm -hmm. a panic of getting mm -hmm. things wrong, mm -hmm. um, of making things worse, mm -hmm. um, or just not knowing how to approach things appropriately or sensitively. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so actually having that that action plan that comes from people with lived experience yes. um, and with those expertise, we found to be like the most important part. So like with both our areas of work for Pride and Practice and Rainbow Badges, we require an executive sponsor for any organization yeah. that takes part yeah. so that they can actually make that change. They yes. can take that next step. It's yes. not just, oh, look at us, we've got this award. Yes. Actually, it's like, what are we doing to get to the next stage? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So important. And hearing that about the framework, because we hear, I hear a lot from colleagues who are heads of EDI, yeah. you know, who are, and are saying, or network chairs, isn't it? Yeah. And they're saying they, they don't have that senior sponsorship or, or support and they're getting stuck or they feel quite isolated. So I love that you called it out up front. Yeah. That's part of the package. Yeah. So let me fr- flip the script a little bit here because um, you're telling us all about what your organization does and what you're responsible for. But I was really intrigued by how you pursued yeah. your role in the organization. So it'd be great to just hear a little bit more about you and your journey into your role right now. Yeah, I mean, it's quite a different one, mm-hmm. I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say that my career history had been somewhat meandering mm-hmm. until I came across LGBT Foundation. So I moved into healthcare when I was approaching my 30s. I, um, I'd previously worked in um, team management, business management. And it was something that I, I'd really wanted to do and not had the opportunity. Um, the opportunity presented itself just before my 30th birthday. So I moved into healthcare. I am, um, and I encountered some situations I am um, around like experiencing homophobia as a queer woman. I am, um, and I encountered some health issues as well mm-hmm. that kind of like led to me having to then ultimately take a step back from um, face-to-face care provision. I yeah. am, um, and. I ended up working in diabetic retinopathy, Mm -hmm. uh, which I really enjoyed. And I got working in um, patient engagement and sort of experiencing and supporting people to um, attend that had previously repeatedly DNA'd and so hadn't attended their appointments. And it was there that we we brought in Pride in Practice. Mm -hmm. So we were um, the first diabetic eye screening um, provider to go through Pride in Practice. And I loved it. I was like, this is amazing. You know, this scheme is so good um, and it was so effective. And seeing it from that side, I really sort of bought into it. Um, And at that point, I kind of was like, this is where I want to be. That's Mm -hmm. somewhere I want to, that's something I want to do and I could see the value in it. Mm -hmm. Um, So I basically started stalking the uh, (laughs) job page. There's no other way to describe it. It was like (laughs) clicking refresh um, on the job page at LGBT Foundation and um, getting myself known. I um, did some volunteering there, um, you know, made sure that I was being engaged and present. And then um, a role came up. And um, it ended up, you know, being absolutely perfect. So I, I came in originally <laughs> um, to uh, look after the Rainbow Badge scheme, the NHS Rainbow Badge program, taking it from that um, symbol through to an accreditation mm-hmm. um, award. And so that was kind of like my baby. Yeah. Um, and that was my start with the organisation. Um, and I've been here, it'll, it'll be uh, three years mm-hmm. in March. And it's been like a fantastic journey. It's such an awesome place to work. Um, And I think for me, it's been like personally really fulfilling Mm -hmm. to feel like some of the situations I encountered in my personal job history, I'm now actually able to challenge. And um, in ways that I didn't maybe feel like I had the power to do before when I was experiencing them. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's quite nice for me to be able to make that positive change for others. Such a, you know, such, it's just... (laughs) It just, I say it amazes me, but it's it's just, it's great to hear your passion mm-hmm. and to see how that drove you. But touching on what you said there about um, some of the things that you experienced yeah. through your previous work and um, envi- working environment and when you wanted to access healthcare as a queer woman mm-hmm. and at that time, not maybe not feeling empowered or able to do something and that's what connected to you seeing why you wanted and I just love how you said I I was getting a job there yeah yeah I was getting in there I was getting in there could you tell me a little bit more about that and I and I if you don't mind me teasing it out a bit more because I know and I know you know we speak to many colleagues don't we who are underrepresented 
particularly from the LGBTQ plus community who feel like I, I can't be myself at work or, you know, I hide my sexuality. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to be open, but people who do want to be open mm. but feel that they can't have experienced um, homophobia at work and, and don't know how to address it or haven't felt empowered to address it. So it'd be good to hear a little bit more from you about that because I know there will yeah. be others listening who feel like that's happened to me. Yeah, absolutely. And it's something that, I'm quite open about anyway because I think um, as someone who who works in this area now people assume that you know oh you've always felt confident and comfortable to handle these things yes but you know there was certainly a time where I didn't mm. I was in a position at one point where you know I walked into a staff room and there was a conversation going on um, and I was new in role um, and I tried to join in with the conversation like oh what's what's happening and, and somebody famous had passed away who, who happened to be um, a gay man and I was like oh what's happened and they said you know this person's passed away and I was like oh no what happened mm. and um, you know a senior professional turned around and went oh it'll be the gay and I remember at the time being really shocked, like, what do you mean yeah, it'll be the gay? But I was a few days into working yeah, in this yeah. role and I'm like, I don't know these people. And I I didn't feel in a position where I could challenge it. Um, and it's something that's always stuck with me that I stayed silent and mm. I just kind of like head down, carry on. But at the same time I realized, well, I can't talk about my wife here. This isn't mm. a safe place for me to be who I am. I, um, and I wish that was like the only experience that I had. It's definitely like the most overt that I've had. Um, but, you know, many a time I've heard slurs being used um, as I got more confident and gobby. <laughs> and, and like you get to a point where you're like, I can't sit quietly. Mm -hmm. um, I would challenge it more. And then sometimes, you, you know, I had colleagues who would find it fun to then deliberately say things because they knew I would challenge them. Mm -hmm. um, so it was never it was never just one thing. There's a multiple layers of these experiences and I'm just one person. Yeah. And it's like, I mean, I could have just gotten lucky, um, but I'm looking at the staff survey results across the NHS mm -hmm. and the statistics are telling me that I wasn't just one unlucky person. Yeah. You know, um, now that we're measuring uh, the experiences of LGBTQ plus staff, mm -hmm. you can see that consistently mm -hmm. they're having poorer experiences. They're experiencing more bullying, um, more harassment, and shockingly more physical violence. Mm -hmm. And that comes from within as well as from patients yeah. and their um, visitors. So all of that to say, I'm really conscious that it's not just me as one person who experienced it, mm -hmm. but also sometimes you're not going to be in a position where it's safe to speak up and challenge yeah. it yeah. um and i was later able to get that opportunity to do that and yeah. i guess that's why i felt so like passionate about doing it and being able to change things so less people will have to have those experiences yeah yeah, wow. yeah. and and i think thank you for being so honest because what you said there about it's not always safe yeah to speak up because we hear so much about speaking up and absolutely, it's the right thing to yeah. do. We talk about allyship, don't we? We talk mm. about um, policies and procedures that you were just speaking about, organisations being accountable yeah. and holding people to account. Whilst that work is in progress, though, we, yeah. as you say, we know that there are colleagues who are experiencing those horrible situations that you just described, and absolutely when it isn't safe. And I think being able to understand that when it isn't safe, what can I do? Where can I go? Where can I access support? Yeah. You know, is there something I can do? Even if, like you said, I definitely have heard from other colleagues about holding guilt, yeah. holding feelings when they haven't spoken up. But I think there's something about also being able to forgive yourself yeah. in the sense of, because if it wasn't safe enough, you, you kept yourself safe yeah. in that moment, isn't it? And then it's what you look at for the support that you may be able to access to support you with that. But I think it's important to talk about that too. Yeah. Yeah. Because I think there's a lot around and it's almost like a victim blaming um, mm. narrative, isn't it? Like, oh, they didn't say anything. They didn't speak up. So it can't have been that bad. Um, but it is. And um, there's also, you know, there's elements of like power at play there, isn't there? Um, in terms of like, who is it that's saying these things? 
Um, and what position do they hold? For sure. Um, for sure. But yeah, you're right. There are schemes there now, and, and you know, I'm lucky to be part of them. Mm -hmm. um, and there are places where you can get that additional support. And it's been really wonderful for me to see so many trusts, especially, mm -hmm. kind of engaging with uh, the work that we do and wanting to not just tick a box and not just do that kind of like, oh, we need to cover this yeah, yeah, community. Yeah. Yes. So yes. let's let's stick a flag up. Actually, yes. no, it's really great to have that symbol so people feel safe, but wanting to do the work and wanting to make change. Um, but it it's a it's a path, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and different areas are at different points. Mm -hmm. You know, there's there's parts of the country that are doing fantastic work, and you can see that they've been doing this for a while. Yes. And there's others that are at the very beginning of their journey and, and they're coming up against all those kind of like hurdles and pushbacks mm -hmm. um, and it's much harder for them. But acknowledging that, so I think yeah. I think it's important again to what you're sharing with us here is, like I said, for people who are responsible, whether you are a board member, mm -hmm. isn't it? Whether you're that exec sponsor, whether you're um, senior in HR, isn't it? Whoever it is who's responsible for or accountable for what we're speaking about, driving change, making environments more inclusive and welcoming, understanding what colleagues are looking for in, around inclusion and belonging, you, are, you can be at different stages. Yeah. And that's okay if you're committed to what you're trying to do. Can't boil the ocean, we know that. Yeah. And that's why I was calling out at the beginning of our conversation, all the different elements of support that your organization offers and that your role covers because you can help people you can help people and organizations wherever they are yes on that part of the journey what i always challenge on is about please don't use journey if you haven't called out where you're trying to get to yeah that's right great. it's very easy to say we're on a journey isn't yeah. it and kind of cover off everything in that well what's the destination and are you communicating that destination with your staff and with the community and service mm -hmm. users about where you're trying to get to, what is it that, you know, what is it you're trying to change in how you provide care and support? And then we can talk about the journey because we know where you're trying to get to. And even engaging, right? So engaging yeah. with the community to understand what is it you need? What is it we need to change? We just did, we had another guest earlier and she said, what matters to you? Rather than asking people, what's the matter with you? Asking yeah. what matters to you. And I just thought, oh my gosh, isn't that so such a simply powerful shift yeah. of how you engage and ask? But co-design in this space is really crucial. And I heard you mention about lived experience. Yeah. You have lived experience. It brings passion. I, I hear from yeah. and see from you. It brings passion to what you do, but also your experience has fueled you into now holding a senior role with, with responsibility for driving this change across, you know, across wider spaces, across more organizations. So let me ask you a question now. You're a leading voice, mm -hmm. right, in the LGBT community because of what we've just said. What sparked your passion for this over and above? So your lived experience and what, what happened to you, that's one thing. Wanting to work for LGBT Foundation, that's another thing. But you're, like I said, you're holding quite a prominent role in space now. We were just talking about your travel and other stuff as well. What, what sparked the passion for kind of stepping into that senior leadership space for you? I think that comes a little bit from within. I'm that kind of person. I would say that I'm like naturally quite driven anyway. Um, but wanting to make the biggest change that I can for the most amount of people mm -hmm. um, and having kids. Mm -hmm. I know it sounds a little bit twee, but you know, I've got a 21 year old and a 17 year old mm -hmm. and being able to influence the environment that, that they're going to experience adulthood mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. and thinking about the workplace for them um, and potentially who even knows their children going yeah. forwards. Yeah. Um, I think that was what drove me around healthcare originally was that kind of like wanting to improve things for individuals. And then I got into patient engagement because I was like, well, I could improve things for more than just my patient group that I yeah. see. Um, and now it's like, it's widening that scope again mm -hmm. and it's being able to make those changes. And I think it's really exciting for me when I see things happening um, and seeing even just like on a one-on-one -on -one level, if I'm supporting a clinician, I'm training a clinician, um, 
and they suddenly you see the point where they get it. Yeah. Um, and then you think, okay, so every person that you deal with now that you support, they're going to have a slightly different experience. And so when we're doing work with trusts and you're working on like a trust wide level, you can then like extrapolate the amount of people that you can be having a yes. positive impact on. Yeah. And that, that for me is like the, why do you get up and get out of bed? Yeah. You know, why do you go to work? And it's like, that's the thing that I can do. I can change, you know, working within the healthcare structures, um, changing those experiences for people that are going through stuff that is scary, mm. um, is mm. um, painful, difficult, um, puts you in a vulnerable position. Mm -hmm. And if people end up having a more positive experience, the knock on from that isn't yeah. just that one experience. Yeah, yeah, the ripple, the scale yeah. that you get from that. So talk to, Staying on the topic of your leadership mm -hmm. and being a leader, how would you describe your leadership style in three words? It's always interesting. So when people <laughs> give you like a specific number and I'm like, I'm more of a <laughs> ramble person. Um, <laughs> but um, I would say, I'm, despite the ramble, I'm quite clear. I think it's really important that people know um, what you expect of them mm -hmm. um, and that they know you know what's their purpose what what are they needing to achieve in that moment so i try and be quite clear and directive whilst giving a level of scope for autonomy um i'd say i'm quite supportive um that's really important to me my best managers have been supportive of mm -hmm. who i am mm -hmm. um so kind of like replicating that in how i support my team is really important and i think i am um, also adaptive like every member of my team, all wonderful people, all very different. Mm -hmm. And you know, how I um, interact with one person will be really different to how I interact with another member of the team because they're different people, right? With different experiences and backgrounds and needs, different communication styles, for some of us, different neurotypes. I am, um, so I think having the ability as a leader to be able to adapt to the needs of your team and not just think about what do I need? Yes. And just, yes. you know, that push out communication, but actually yes. being able to think about how does this person need me to, to direct them? Do they need direction? Actually, does this person want direction? Because some people need a lot more and it's a safety net for them. For others, that would feel like smothering. Yes, yes, yes. yes. So tuning into that. Um, yeah. As you said, being ad um, adaptable with that. Listening to listening to what you shared there about your style and supportive. So if I pick mm -hmm. up on that, if you were if we, if you were speaking to uh, someone who's underrepresented because you have intersectionality, mm -hmm. you know, um, thinking about that that could be that could be quite challenging. But you're here and you're in a senior role. What would you say to someone who's underrepresented, coming up through the ranks, who wants to pursue a leadership role? What advice would you give to them? I think there's a real power in being present. Mm -hmm. um, so take opportunities mm -hmm. um, and look for your cheerleaders. Mm -hmm. I think that is like the best route forward. It's certainly how I've got, you know, most of my opportunities is, is looking out for those people who will have my back, who'll yes. support me, who'll champion my work. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, it's exactly why I'm here when you offer me the opportunity. <laughs> I'm like, yes. Mm -hmm. um, but doing that on a personal level, mm -hmm. looking for the people that will bring you along uh, and support you is the best way. Um, and it gives you that network as well. So I think it's really important if you are um, somebody who's stepping into a space where perhaps people like you haven't haven't been before in a work environment and you're um, having that kind of like experience of being that first face and carrying all of that because it, it mm -hmm. comes with pressure yes. and expected and, and unwanted sometimes additional responsibilities. Having good allies, having that strong network will give you that support that you need. So like look for those people. Mm. What you touched on there, so 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 true, right? I you know, really respect your honesty. That is one of our, um, being honest is one of our values that we stand by here, but really respect your honesty and what you're saying there about actually Yes, we want to see more representation at senior level, but the reality is you may be the only one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, flipping the, Just flipping that round then, what would you want to say to senior decision makers? So to, you know, boards, existing boards, to chairs, to CEOs, what would you want to say to them about if you are trying to increase diversity in your boardroom and at senior level, 
um, and particularly if, uh, um, seeing representation of senior leaders who are from the LGBT community, what would you be saying to them? How, what, what do they need to be thinking about in relation to that? I think it's around stepping outside from a tick box. Mm -hmm. So it's not just, oh, you know, we need to have an LGBTQ plus person mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. um, it's making that change so the environment is appropriate. So that, you know, you've done the work within that, that group to make sure that people are going to be, someone stepping in is going to be respected and treated appropriately. <laughs> I am <clears throat> thinking about the limitations of experience that people in marginalised communities will have mm -hmm. and how do you then enable them to feel empowered to engage and to apply as well yes. Um, yes. and doing the work to reach out to the communities so that people do feel secure in that. Um, it's it's again, it's that meaningful bit that's so important because there's always going to have to be a first person. Yes. Um, yeah. But it, yeah. it's what do you do so that as as a board, as a group, or as a senior um, person within an organisation, you make that environment the right one as they're stepping in. Yes. And it's not passing that responsibility. Oh my goodness! Such powerful, such powerful advice that you've just offered there. Absolutely clear. You said you like to be clear. Absolutely clear because I think all too often we speak from the side of those who are in the minority yeah. and, and those who are underrepresented. We're almost hearing now that you know development programs and support are needed. So I'm not disputing that, but are over indexed, mm -hmm. and we're not working with like some of the work you do to educate and support those in the majority. Yeah, those holding my so re really, really. So that Liam, that's our highlight clip. I'm saying it live on <laughs> this episode. That is our highlight clip there because really powerful advice. Coming at this from a so. Asked you about someone who's aspiring mm -hmm. to get into senior leadership. Asked you from the decision maker's perspective. Can I ask you the question now? So from a service user and employee perspective, let's think about healthcare mm -hmm. in its broadest terms. What would you want to, um, what do you think should be prioritised so that healthcare is more inclusive? What are the sort of two or three key things you'd say should be prioritised there? I think the biggest thing is education as yeah. a whole. I, um, I think, first of all, taking healthcare um, as, as a, an overarching umbrella there, um, stopping the tranching of we're doing this one piece for employees, we're doing this one piece for patients, mm -hmm. and actually seeing the value of um, work that's twofold because if you are working on an educational basis yeah. and you're improving the competency and confidence that your workforce has around supporting LGBTQ plus people, what's that, you know, knock on yes. for your staff? Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, actually yeah. if you're doing the educational work and you're doing the like the groundwork essentially to understand what are the health inequalities, mm -hmm. what are the barriers mm -hmm. experienced then you start to understand more about the experiences of your of your workforce as well. Yeah. And you're teaching them that respect is important. And it sounds really simple, but again, coming back to those staff survey results, it's clearly missing, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, and we know that it's missing in clinical education. We know that it's missing in nursing education. I do a lot of work um, supporting universities and med schools around, you know, add-ons to the mm -hmm. curriculum mm -hmm. um, to think outside the stereotypes. So, you know, when you're thinking about medical um, education for aspiring doctors, you know, it's not just a case study that is a gay man with AIDS, for example, or HIV positive. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's thinking about the additionals and just the general stuff. But that education is like the biggest difference because I think the greatest pushback that we get when we we start a process with a trust or with um, any kind of healthcare provider is always the people that think it's not needed because they think, what difference does it make who you sleep with to the care I give you? Mm -hmm. or what mm -hmm. difference does it make what you um, perceive your gender as? To the care I give you, it doesn't matter. I'm still giving you good quality care, mm. and like both can be true. It can matter, yeah. and you can need to adapt your your style and what you're doing to understand. And if you don't have that understanding, then you're not giving that personalised care. But that's not that's not saying you're a bad nurse or a bad no. GP or a bad consultant. It's just saying that you don't understand the specific 
needs and inequalities that person's gone through. Mm-hmm. Um, and having that knowledge really opens it up to you um, and engaging with communities to understand. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the things that I was really surprised by, and I talk about it a lot because it's a really clear statistic that really helps people understand, is um, 33% of um, lesbian, gay and bisexual women have at some point been told by a healthcare professional that they don't need a smear because they sleep with women. Um, and that's a third of, of, of my communities yeah. that have been told they don't need this test that is actually a population-wide screening yes. provision yeah. that's there because it's yeah. needed. Yeah. Um, and they will be getting their letters through every three years saying, you know, you, you need a smear. Well, because healthcare professionals told them they don't, they might just ignore that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So even though all the all the stuff is in place to reach them, they've been given inaccurate information yeah. that means that they feel they don't need to engage. And that's an opportunity for patient harm. And if you're just coming into, you know, this conversation with a patient not knowing that and not having an awareness that that's something that's happened to you know a third mm-hmm. of queer women mm-hmm. like how are you tackling that if mm-hmm. you just don't know mm-hmm. i am um, comes back to what you said before you don't know what you don't know and that's exactly that's not insulting anyone's intelligence you're no. just saying if it's, it's not on your radar it's not your aware. experience yeah it's not it's not something you're thinking about and that's just one area of health care mm-hmm. i am um, and in in every area um, that we look at, where we've measured it, where there's evidence that has said what is the experience for LGBTQ plus people compared to cisgender or mm-hmm. heterosexual people, mm-hmm. there is a worse experience. Mm-hmm. Um, so actually, it does matter who you sleep with. Mm-hmm. It's not that you're going to offend your nurse or your GP or your consultant by who you sleep with, but actually, you know, you might present later. For healthcare, yes, because yes. of your identity, yes. you might be more reticent about the information that you share. You might have high risk factors. You're more likely to smoke, for example, which can lead to additional risks. All of that changes your profile mm-hmm. as a patient mm-hmm. and as someone who's who's supporting that patient. It changes the experience for mm-hmm. that for that patient. I um, so there's so much that. That simple act of education and understanding and reaching out to the community and and learning about those differences can overcome that I know you asked for a couple, but I think like education yeah. is just so it overarching. Underpins. Yeah. It underpins it and I think thank you for unpacking it because yeah, like I asked her, but actually what you've explained is how how it underpins everything, but also what you were saying there. The NHS is the largest employer in the mm-hmm. UK and more often than not, usually is the largest local employer yeah. in areas, isn't it? So when we, when you were speaking about if we educate um, the workforce, the ripple effect, well, the workforce are usually the community, aren't they? Because they're, yeah. <laughs> you're the largest employer. So it goes, I really heard you, it goes hand in hand in relation to that. So you've really taken us on a journey here, Alex. I feel like one, to learn a little bit more about you, Mm -hmm. you know, your passion and drive, because you're being brave at senior level, and this is what we're talking about, but also helping us to understand more about what LGBT Foundation does, Mm -hmm. how it supports people, NHS organizations, wider organizations as well, and where we can find out more. My very last question for you though, is because you are busy, (laughs) <laughs> you are driving a lot and you're you're holding a lot of responsibility both like what you were sharing about being that role model for your community as well um as well as driving what the foundation is doing what do you do for yourself to get balance and keep balance and well-being um i'm quite crafty I am um, so for me and we talked about it a little bit yeah. before like you know that time not on a screen mm-hmm. because so much of my day is spent either um on my phone, on my laptop, in meetings, Mm -hmm. especially over Zoom and Teams (laughs) and stuff. Um, Actually having downtime off screen is really important. Mm -hmm. Um, I've been really enjoying cross stitch, which sounds like a real, a granny-ish hobby, Um, but I'm here for it. It's something that I can just sit and there's a mindfulness in that activity of Mm -hmm. like taking thread, taking cloth and and making something mm-hmm. um, and being able to just spend a couple of hours and there you've got this like neat achievable kind of like goal that you can hit. I hear that. When you're dealing with quite 
big concepts that's mm-hmm. quite nice mm-hmm. to have that little something that you're like oh I've just done that yeah yeah I am um, so I do that a lot and then I've got my dogs I am um, I've got um my family and they're you know super important spending time with them and and playing with them is yeah something that allows me to just relax I think I, I, we ask the question all the time because as I say here it's about being honest yeah. and it's about being real and I think life is busier than ever mm-hmm. um life as a leader as a senior leader it can be really challenging life as a leader when you're underrepresented and you're driving that change and that scale that you described yeah. so clearly today is ever more challenging so i think being able to ask about balance and what you do and how you do it i think it's important for our listeners to hear that as well that yeah. to keep you going this is some of what you do as well to keep your well-being so Alex, thank you, because it's been, I knew it was going to be an insightful conversation, but I think just being able to share understanding, um, I feel galvanized by your passion, actually. Um, And just, I hope for people listening, I'm sure even if it's just one person, but there'll be many who feel inspired by the way how, you know, what you experienced, not just drove you to drive change for others, but to actually seek a career path that enabled you to do it on such a big scale. I think it's such an inspiring story. So thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. It's been lovely.